listening to The Sower, a podcast of the Ciceronian Society. The Ciceronian Society is a community of Christian scholars and public intellectuals committed to the examination of three core themes, tradition, place, and things divine, and their role in the intellectual discipleship of the church and civilization. To learn more about us, our events, this podcast, our journal, Pietas, to sign up for our newsletter, and to make your tax-deductible gift, please go to ciceronianciety.org, that's C-I-C-E-R-O-N-I-A-N-S-O-C-I-E-T-Y.org. I always struggle saying that. Um, I'm Josh Bowman, Vice President of the Ciceronian Society, and before we get started, please join me in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray, O Lord, that you would bless our conversation, and that all we say and do would bring glory and honor to you. Amen. Now today I'm joined by one of my closest friends and no stranger to the regulars of the Ciceronian Society, William Batchelder IV. Bill, how are you doing? Hey, Josh, it's great to talk to you, and it's a great uh, honor to be able to talk about Dad uh, in this context. So I'm, I'm well. The opportunity to do this is a great thing. Great. All right. Well, Bill, I, I'm, I'm not going to give a lengthy introduction for him. Uh, he's a, uh, is an associate professor um, of history at Waynesburg University, um, and uh, he's been with the Ciceronian Society since the beginning. And, um, you know, if, if you hear him laugh on this podcast and you can't remember his face, you'll know exactly who I'm talking about if you've been to the conference. Um, and I say that with love. Um, <laughs> just think, yeah, just think Rasputin and then that laugh. Um, now, there you go. You heard it? You heard it? All right. Now, back in February 2022, the Batchelder family, the Ciceronian Society, the state of Ohio, and frankly, the American Republic, uh, lost uh, a great man and a great statesman, Bill's father, William Batchelder III. The Bill Batchelder, or Bill Batchelder the Greater, or maybe Bill the, the Elder, as I'll call him, was one of our earliest and most enthusiastic supporters. Um, and uh, he even joined us for our 2018 uh, conference in, at Hope College in Holland, Michigan, where I live now. And I'll let uh, Bill the Younger give a much better sketch of his life. But one of the reasons that uh, your dad cared about what we're doing is because of how much he exemplified an affection for a sense of place. And that's why we have an award in his name. Now, before we get to that, let's get to know the man himself. So, Bill, I'm going to hand it over to you. Give us a quick version of your dad's story. Absolutely. And if, if you hear any uh, noise in the background, running around in the background is uh, little William George Batchelder V and his twin brother, James uh, so uh, some of the grandchildren uh, may be uh, bleeding through here in the sound. Um, so uh, Grandma uh, was pregnant with Dad when Grandpa left for World War II. Um, he didn't much like the fascists anyway, and then he volunteered uh, to fight after Pearl Harbor. Uh, so Dad was born in 1942, but he didn't get to meet his own father until he was three years old. Um, Dad grew up in Medina, Ohio, a block from where I would later grow up, uh, on Washington Street near Harmony Street. Um, and Dad got to know people all over the county. Uh, his father was prosecutor for a time and then was a successful trial attorney and involved uh, there in the, you know, the sort of small town in the county Republican Party. Um, his uncle, by marriage, uh, was the chief of police uh, in Medina. Um, and his best friends, some of them were his cousins, uh, the sons of the chief of police, who grew up about seven blocks away, give or take. Um, he was the class president uh, at Medina High School. Um, and then he went on to Ohio Wesleyan, uh, where he studied history. In the, in the summers, at least some of his summers, he worked at the uh, bank as a teller, the old Phoenix uh, National Bank, which had been uh, run by H.G. Blake, one of his heroes. More on Blake maybe in a moment. Um, and uh, so, and then he again, finished his degree in history at Ohio Wesleyan, and then took a law degree at the uh, Ohio State University. Yeah. What he really I'm wanted... I, I, I'm so sorry. I had to interrupt you there. I just... For, for those of you who don't know, I'm a Maize and Blue Michigan, University of Michigan football fan, so every time he's going to say that in this podcast, I'm going to get triggered. That's the word. Okay, continue. We'll try to I'm work so it so in. So a, <laughs> we'll try to work it in a few more times. I'm so um, sorry. Go Blue. <laughs> yeah, I, Dad and I watched a lot of uh, Ohio State games, though he he would always use the, uh, he would, okay, actually, here's a, here's a great story. So he was uh, a judge uh, for a time uh, from 1998 to 2005. And he had a trial where a guy was suspected of uh, killing somebody. 
And one of the major pieces of evidence in the trial was that he had behaved very suspiciously around the time the person was deceased. And by that, they meant he didn't come in to watch the Ohio State-Michigan game. He was fooling around the garage for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that was damning evidence. Um, <laughs> but at any rate, so <laughs> after Ohio State, um, and what, what Dad really wanted to be his whole life um, was a legislator, uh, a state representative, and a form of Dinah County, um, not just anywhere, for his home place. And really what he wanted more than anything was to be Speaker uh, of the Ohio House. So he came back uh, from having earned his law degree and he ran for the legislature. And just as his campaign was starting, he got drafted. Um, mm -hmm. So my mother, um, Alice Batchelder, actually ran the campaign uh, while dad was uh, gone. I mean, he didn't get sent to Vietnam. He was just in, in training and, and so forth. Um, he won the primary, which is to say, in a sense, she won it, um, yeah. <laughs> and then won the general, and then the army discharged him, because how's he supposed to go back and do roll call votes, right? Right. It's not, not in Medina. So the army discharged him when he won. Um, at that time, he was the youngest person ever elected to the House of Representatives, and his hmm. first stint there was from 40 years, from 1968 uh, to 1998. And of course, we are always just uh, so grateful to the. It, originally, it was Medina County and Ashland County too, and then eventually it was it was just Medina County. Um, we've always been uh, obviously so grateful that over and over, every two years, um, they would they would send Dad back, and it was you know almost never even close. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, he was a state. Uh, it was a common pleas judge. Uh, and then a state appeals court judge, briefly from 1998 to 2005. Um, and then he ran for the legislature again in 2006, won his seat back. And then from 2011 to 2014, he achieved his childhood ambition and actually was able to serve as the Speaker of the Ohio House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. um, he was the only, only the second legislator from Medina County to, to achieve that. And the first was one of his childhood heroes, Colonel H.G. Blake. Um, so again, I don't know a lot of people who go through life, finish their life, accomplish, having accomplished the thing they set out to do yeah. when they were, when they were quite young. Uh, and, and this was what he wanted. And it wasn't that kind of ghastly ambition that we get from so much of our credential class now, mm -hmm. which was just something, anything, any position to try to secure some sort of sense of worth or value. It was this position. Exactly. Yeah. This is what he wanted to do. Um, they actually had asked him at one point, I think it was Newt Gingrich asked him and met with him mm -hmm. about running for uh, Congress uh, to represent, of course, a much larger district in Northeast Ohio, uh, which polling would have indicated that he absolutely could have won, mm -hmm. uh, but he didn't want to leave Ohio. Yeah. I didn't want to leave my, my little sister. I was pretty much gone, but my sister was home. I, he, he didn't want to leave her. But also, you know, he loathed Washington, D.C. Um, <laughs> and and he he and, and everything about it. Uh, and he did not want to go to Congress. He wanted to be a representative for Medina only in the Ohio context. That's what he loved. His intense affection uh, was was for Ohio. Can you tell me? Uh, you mentioned H. G. Blake. I, I've never mm. heard that name before, because it, it, it it's such a specific dream that your dad had yeah. going for, right? Yes. I mean, I I've never heard of anyone saying, "I, I want to be this." I mean, I, I'm from Michigan. I never heard anyone say, "I want to be the Speaker of the Michigan House." Um, it, and it's just it's just so striking. I mean, part of the thing is in Michigan, the Speaker basically has no power. Um, and but that I'm wondering, is a peculiarity of Ohio, by the yeah. way, is that. If you have a strong governor, the Speaker of the House is the second most powerful uh, mm -hmm. person in Ohio. If you have a weak governor or the Speaker and the governor are feuding, <laughs> mm -hmm. the Speaker in the right hands, the person who knows what he's doing, uh, mm -hmm. the Speaker is a very powerful uh, position in Ohio. So who is H.G. Um, Blake? Uh, yeah. So Blake um, was a, a Medina um, resident who actually had a house on, on Washington— Mm -hmm. uh, same as, as my father grew up in, about two blocks away uh, on Washington Street. He had a, a lovely Greek Revival 
home there. Um, and he helped, I, th I think he started the bank. If he didn't, yeah, he did. He's founded the old Phoenix National Bank, um, which was uh, on the square and was one of the most important in business institutions in Medina. Um, he was elected to Congress uh, in 1859. He was an abolitionist. His house was very definitely a stop on the Underground Railroad. Hmm. Um, he was very successful uh, as a businessman, but he was also a legislator uh, f uh, in the House of Representatives before he went to Congress. He was a legislator as a Whig, um, and it, very briefly, he was a speaker uh, of the Ohio House, um, and Dad admired him. Well, first of all, having a stop at Underground Railroad is a it's a sort of a magnificent thing. Of course. Um, and the fact that he had really was Medina's most important citizen. Um, and then uh, he signed up for the Civil War when Lincoln pressed for more volunteers in February of 1864. Uh, and so he he volunteered uh, and was was made a, a colonel. Um, so and, and then, you know, he came back. Uh, he lived, I think, until 1878, maybe. Something oh, okay. like that. He was also mayor in Medina. And so mm -hmm. dad grew up, uh, 1876 he died. Dad grew up admiring Blake, um, admiring his, he was of course in the Republican Party after the, the Whigs collapsed, right? He was a supporter of, of Lincoln and he was mm -hmm. a, a member of the Union Army. Um, and that was a big deal in Medina. If you go in the Medina Cemetery, uh, the first thing that greets you uh, after a, a stone arch and a lovely tall trees which have been planted there um is a, a wonderful statue of a union army soldier uh, medina county lost a lot of boys uh mm -hmm. and it was a, a center of, of uh, enthusiasm for the union and enthusiasm for abolition in some cases not as much as like oberlin uh area in lorraine but it was a it was definitely an abolitionist uh, area dad's actually buried um quite close to where that statue is i'm, I'm pleased to say um and uh, every um, Memorial Day in Medina, they give the uh, Gettysburg Address uh, from memory. Hmm. Uh, so that that's still that that Union Army um, and, and that the Civil War really stamped uh, a, a lot of, of, you know, even in the, when my dad was a was a young man. The fact that there had been a, a colonel here who'd been important and had a spot on the Underground Railroad was a big deal. Another big Medina hero was A.I. Root. Um, Root observed a swarm of bees on the beautiful uh, Medina Square uh, and had become curious about them and ended up uh, setting up one of the most important uh, waxworks hmm. um, in, uh, in the United States uh, and also was a witness of the uh, Wright brothers' flight. Uh, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, other prominent Ohioans, of course. Um, <laughs> right. So... Um, yeah, I, I th those kind of figures. Dad would talk about them. Uh, first of all, you would be forgiven if you walked into the middle of a story in the room uh, for thinking they were still alive. Um, <laughs> you know, the, right. the, the way that he, the way that <laughs> my he buddy H. G. Blake. Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, because uh, t to him, as long as Medina was there, Blake was there, and Root was there, and mm -hmm. uh, and and he always sort of emphasized the heroic in people that he liked. And he liked a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and he would always see, he would romanticize the people that he liked. He would always see their best self. I'm ashamed to say I'm, I'm more cynical than he was. And it's not that he, I mean, he was survived in politics for, you know, 50 years. He wasn't a naive at all, you know, right, obviously. Right, right. Uh, but he would, find a heroic self in the selves that he met. Hmm. And, and that was a beautiful thing that he did. And, yeah. and so in that sense, he could view the living and the dead the same way. Uh, because of course, if we have people that are dead, that were noble or heroic, it's their nobility and their heroism is really what lives best. Mm -hmm. um, but even in people that were alive, he would look for things. If somebody had served in Patton's army, even though he told me that 20 times when I ran into that person, he'd say, yeah, now, you know, Billy, he served with Patton uh, in World War II or, you know, his scoutmaster had uh, seen some of the really nasty fighting mm -hmm. um, 
uh, in, in, in France and on the way into Germany during World War II. He wouldn't talk about it. Uh, mm-hmm. but, but Dad was so honored to know him and would always talk about that. And, you know, that, that was the sort of thing that, that, that he did and, and that he was. And so he linked that heroism to the people he liked. He linked their heroism to the people that were dead. And he linked all of it to the place that he lived and, and had an intense affection. So it wasn't a antiquarian's affection for empty buildings or mm-hmm. pieces of things at a museum, though he might have liked that. It was the idea that Medina was and is at the same time that is what he loved. You know, it, it makes me think about how you know, there's gr- growing up, I grew up in a town called Monroe, Michigan. And, um, you know, we, <laughs> there, there was often a, a, in my time, a, a disparagement of the town. Um, just let's talk about all the things we can be embarrassed about. Yes. Um, and, and one of the things though, <laughs> here's the thing though, the, the biggest statue in town is of General George George Armstrong Custer because he uh, was a, a kid there, and no so kidding. <laughs> yeah, and so apparently, like it, it, when I think of like the people that that you know that that we remember in Monroe, it's George, George Custer, and we still have we I mean statues still there. How that statue has survived the last decade blows my mind. Um, but there <laughs> he is. But it's, at, at the same time, like no one ever took the time to say, except except for my great grandma. I, I I'll take that back who would eventually say, you know, let me tell you about this doctor or this entrepreneur or this um, statesman or this particular person or just or just this person who no one knows, but they meant a lot to me because they they had that heroic, that um, heroism within them that your dad could see in, in many people. Um, I, I guess that, that leads to, to the next question I want to ask. So this is your dad's story. What do you think is his legacy and his impact in Ohio? What what comes to mind? What, if you asked the people that worked with him uh, in, in Columbus and elsewhere, how would they describe, how did they describe his legacy when he passed? Well, it was interesting. One aspect of his legacy that was described to me a lot that I, you know, it's not that I didn't see that side of him. It's that as a parent, I'm going to right. see this side of him so often that I wouldn't understand. Uh, so many people came up and said, Bill told me to make this move in my career and hmm. I, I didn't think I could do it. And he told me I should do it and I should take X risk or I should try Y thing. I mean, I can't tell you many people told me that the dad was often a better champion for people than they were for themselves. And hmm. he would tell them, Oh yeah, you can do that. You'll be fine. And here's why you'll be fine. And, um, he wasn't threatened by other people's success Um, and that's because he wasn't successful because he was trying to prove something to himself or fill some kind of a hole. That's not why he did what he did. And so when other people were succeeded, he was delighted. Um, so he was always happy to give people advice to, you know, there are people in Congress now, one, one in whom, which, you know, anybody listening to this podcast would have heard of, um, that dad absolutely championed, uh, that person's career. Mm -hmm. Dad never felt threatened by someone going off to the national level and, you know, getting headlines and so forth. He was pleased to see it happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so that one form of legacy he had is I know so many people who are very pleased with what they've been able to do in their careers and, and, and public service and intellectual life, different kinds of jobs, not all just politics. And in, in those cases, they would, they had told me around the time of the funeral, Oh yeah, your dad told me to go do this. I wasn't sure if I should do it or not. So mm-hmm. that was one thing that I didn't know about, uh, until I met him. Another mm-hmm. thing and of course, the the whole country is is uh, increasingly riven by a, a you know a culture war. And of course, you and I are both writing about Philip Reef, and so mm-hmm. thinking deeply about culture war is something that that we've had to do. Of course, Dad was up to his uh, neck in that. Um, he wrote the partial birth abortion ban, other right to life legislation, wrote school choice legislation that went all the way to the Supreme Court and then was upheld. Uh, mm-hmm. by the Supreme Court, which had national uh, precedent. Um, there were some of that. He didn't like to be a culture warrior in the sense that we see on Twitter now or in the sense right. we see on the Internet now. He didn't He didn't care for that. He did it out of, of a, frankly, religious conviction and conviction about the sanctity of, of the person. Mm-hmm. Um, not to, you know, own libs or whatever. Some of his best friends were left-wing members, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, but... Uh, some of that stuff, I, I mean, that that's not going to be resolved in our lifetimes either. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we at the Ciceronian Society do not take 
political positions in the sense of partisan or legislative positions, but I can't think of anybody who reveres tradition, place, and things divine that doesn't see the importance of people having access to a religious education, if that's what their conscience dictates, uh, or doesn't understand the sanctity of life and in those things. Um, he, he demonstrated a real perseverance. He was asked one time by a reporter, you know, you're way out beyond your district in this question of abortion. And he said, no, they don't like it. They can send me home. Because <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't matter. He, he would go home before he would give an inch yeah. on, on the things that mattered, that mattered the most. And that was his other legacy. He promised my mom when he got elected that he would never cast a vote that wasn't on principle. And I don't, you know, I don't think he ever did. Mm -hmm. um, he was willing to take the hits. That didn't mean that you can't do things that are politics. You can't be a fool. You have to build yeah. coalitions and you have to do things like that. And he, he did do those things. But on the things um, that are profoundly questions of conscience, um, mm -hmm. there nobody ever had to wonder where he was. Um, <laughs> you know, no one ever had to wonder where he was. So I think well, that was that kind of example was another thing. I want to switch gears here then and talk a little bit about, um, with, with that story uh, in mind, um, we now have, and this started this uh, here at uh, the Belmont Abbey uh, Conference back uh, in 2023, we announced the William G. Batchelder III Memorial Award for the Study of Place. And I want to talk about that and, and, and why uh, we thought this was a good idea. And, and uh, tell our, our listeners um, how, we, how it's chosen, you know, why it's, you know, we, I think we get why it's named after him at this point, but how, how it's chosen, what, what we hope to do with this award and promote. Well, one of the uh, things which is really, I think, countercultural uh, about the Ciceronian society um, in our interdisciplinary focus on tradition, place, and things divine is, is place. Um, so much of our culture uh, was already placeless. Right. There were three places that mattered. Right. There was Los Angeles. There was New York. There was Washington, D.C. And if you lived anywhere else, you're supposed to be embarrassed about it. And I hate that. And I know you hate that. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, and it's it's I'm sorry. I mean, I, I hate to put it to sharply. It's fundamentally un-American. Yeah. Um, and and America's not shaped like Chile. Um, it's actually a continent spanning country. It's not just. Washington to New York to Los Angeles, there's a lot in between there and there's a lot of beauty and there's a lot of struggle and there's a lot of agony and there's a lot of triumph uh, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of, of the human experience uh, in between there. And I think that um, some of the best of, of what's American um, is, is localist. You know, you think about Grant Wood's paintings, if you think about um, the writing of something like Winesburg, Ohio, if you think about the way that politics is done so often when it's done best, it's done locally. Um, mm -hmm. So many of us um, are shaped by where we are. And of course, now that the internet, which is, you know, by and large ghastly uh, has been invented, uh, that makes people even more placeless. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we wish to be countercultural or if, Philip Reeves words, we wish to be counter anti-cultural. Uh, <laughs> one of the ways that we want to do that is to restore study of place, pride of place. And what does place mean? Sometimes when you say that you want to be a partisan of place, people automatically envision rural places. And, and that's, there is nothing wrong with that. And of course, we always think of Wendell Berry because people that are attracted to Ciceronian society and tend to be also attracted to Wendell Berry. And of course, my father was deeply attached. Dad could drive around the county and tell you who owned what field, which family owned which farms, uh, how one family was related to another. It was astonishing. He'd go mm -hmm. out to the county fair and he would, they, people didn't have to rec introduce themselves to him. He knew who they were. Oh, um, it was an amazing thing. But also... Um, he knew all about Wadsworth and Brunswick and Medina, uh, the towns, uh, not just the rural places, but the towns. And he had a, a, a deep interest in Cleveland. And of course, Cleveland has been treated as a, a punchline, but it, it's not. Cleveland has a, a glorious history and it was the, the nearest big city to us. And we would drive over. There's a massive bridge 
on the way into Cleveland, his grandfather was a master tool and die maker. And below that bridge used to be so many factories and steel work, steel mills that dad said that the bridge would be obscured by smoke and it would look like the valley was on fire. Mm -hmm. And he would talk about that like he personally experienced some kind of loss because those plants were gone. Not, mm -hmm. oh, it's too bad guys aren't working there anymore, but that it was something that was his and it was yeah. taken from him. Yeah. Um, and and so he, he loved the, the nearby cities too. And he didn't love them the more they were like Medina. He loved them for themselves. He could drive into Cleveland and point to all of the domes of the churches and tell you that's the Greek Orthodox Church, that's the Serbians, that's Presbyterian, from the highway at 65 miles an hour, not always maintaining his lane, um, he <laughs> would point to these different, you know, onion domes and steeples and everything else. And, and, and he loved all that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, um, now I will get to how the recipient is chosen, but one of the things I want to point out is, you know, if you're, if you're listening to this and you're interested in, in pursuit, cause this, this award rewards scholarship that is related to this, yes. this, 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 thing of place. Now, the subject of place is huge. There are so many, there are places, there are ways you could go about this that we have not thought of and will not think of until you bring it to us, right? Um, and there's just, just so. so many ways that, that we, 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 we could see this happening. Um, our first uh, winner was Luke Sheehan of Duquesne University. Um, his paper, The State versus Community, uh, Nisbet and the Post-Liberal Right, was about, um, well, it was about Robert Nisbet. Nisbet, of course, is a, a, a major scholar when we think of the idea of place, um, Wendell Berry is a good example. Um, there's a lot of other ways you could go about this. If you are in the fields of public history, there's a lot of opportunity there, uh, as well as sociology and political science. Um, if you are in the world of uh, nonprofit and, de and uh, uh, development, one of the things, and Bill, I haven't, I haven't really talked to you about this, but one of the projects I'm starting out with a, a, another organization, um, we've been thinking a lot about how poverty uh, and is related to this issue of place. If uh, there's, I'm just reading a book by Seth Kaplan called Fragile Neighborhoods, and his whole thing is that a sense of place matters a lot for whether or not a neighborhood thrives economically, and whether or not poverty is a thing. Um, mm. That poverty is often um, exacerbated when there is a lack of a sense of place. So I think one of the things that comes to mind when people think of a sense of place nowadays is they might think of this kind of romanticized localism where when we say a sense of place, we're thinking of it, it's, it's nostalgia, basically. But that's not what we mean. This is a very real, no. uh, visceral, um, impactful, empirical reality that if you lose a sense of place, you will not love that place anymore. You won't take care of it. And you, you'll lose a connection that the... You know, some sociologists will call it the bonding. I think it's I think the way they say it is bonding capital, right? Where uh, the things that join us together break down, and the the structures that are not they're not government structures, they're social structures. They're they're structures with civil institutions and civil society that help keep us out of trouble, help keep us out of poverty, and help keep us out of crime, help keep us from hurting ourselves and hurting others. That when that stuff breaks, when you lose a sense of place, when that stuff breaks down. Um, a lot of people suffer from that. Um, that's really what we're getting at in many ways. Uh, and so I, I, I want to encourage you, if you're, listening, if you're an economist, if you're in the nonprofit world, there's a lot of ways you could go with this. And we want to encourage you to, you know, in future conferences, in our journal, uh, we are a place to send that scholarship. We're one of the few places that would even pay attention to it, frankly. Um, and so I want, to, I want to make sure we get that across. Um, yeah, I, I think that is... I think it is really important. And, and the other thing is, frankly, if if you don't have any sense of place, if, if you're feeling just completely and totally isolated, um, mm -hmm. then you're also going to be, uh, it's, you're going to have a much harder time governing yourself. You're mm -hmm. going to have a hard time asserting yourself. You're going to have a hard time feeling as though you can have any impact on, on what's around you. And I think this is one of the reasons that Washington politics are so much more toxic uh, mm -hmm. and that local politics can be quite civil um, because at the local level, people are still human beings. Um, yeah. the, the other thing is when we talk about, when we talk about place and, and our interest in place in the Ciceronian society, um, Wendell Berry is a magnificent ambassador for his place, but August Wilson is a magnificent ambassador for his 
Mm -hmm. um, African American neighborhoods are just as much uh, places and uh, have just as many profound experiences and just as many of the, the spiritual things that make us human and, and bind us together. Right? We are not simply talking about the experience of of rural people uh, in right. the United States. And of course, Medine is a little of everything, uh, except for big city. The big city you got to go to Cleveland. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's small towns, and 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 frankly, Medina's become a big town. Um, and it's, it's farms and it's townships. Uh, but, um, having a sense of place applies just as much to, you know, a, a crown Heights section of one borough of New right. York or whatever, you know, that, that's, that is just as legitimately, uh, an object of not only study, but of, of affection and even of devotion. Yeah. And I think another part of what there's, you know, in some of the things I've been reading, um, what we also want to bring to the table is the relationship of our faith to the sense of place. You know, I, yeah. Eugene Peterson, um, and I was reading a book by him recently called Under the Unpredictable Plant. Um, it's an interesting title, you know, reflecting on the, uh, the prophet Jonah. But one of the things that he emphasizes in, in that book and others is how as pastors or as ministers or as people who are uh, involved in ministry, you're never, you're always in a context. You are a embodied um, how, how, how does he say it? Like you are in a place and you don't ever forget it, that God has called you to minister to a very specific place through your specific church. And, and churches can be um, great ways to uh, connect us to place in meaningful, lasting, and enduring ways. And I think in that is that to me has been missing in much of the scholarship, both from the religious side and from the non-religious side. Um, and I think there's a lot of room uh, to grow there. It's it's one of the ways that um, places become what they are. And I think churches could also do a better job of of thinking about uh, the places, how they connect to the places that they're in, both culturally and historically, um, especially some of these newer churches that you may not have the historic buildings, but you you still have that. You, you've still brought in generations of people that have been there for, for years um, you know, I, I live here in Holland, Michigan, and there's, there is this um, conscientiousness, I think it's the word I'm going to use, where um, if your family was one of those families who came in the mid-19th century from um, Holland, from the, the Holland, uh, then you, you, you have a sense of place because you want to protect this, this land that the Dutch uh, settled um, in many ways and the culture that, that's still here. There's also a really cool sense of place here among a very old Hispanic community um, that I'm still trying to get, uh, get to know, but they, they've been here for a long time, um, even before uh, you know, some of the other ones that, that popped up after, the 19, after 1965 and the Immigration Act. But um, this is a very old Hispanic community. It's really, really uh, cool to get to know. Um, and so I want to encourage you all to, do, to, to look at that now. Bill, one, one last thing before we conclude here. How will the recipients be chosen um, going forward? Well, um, probably about the way we chose them last time, which is that uh, um, my my mother um, mm -hmm. read the papers and looked at the papers, and so does my uh, my sister. Now, my mother is a, a federal appeals court um, judge um, for the Sixth Circuit and is a, a learned person uh, herself, um, and so she takes a, a, a lively interest in these papers. And my sister, who uh, lives with her four children in Ohio. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, she went, went to St. John's, which is arguably in excess of learning, uh, <laughs> in Annapolis, uh, and, and is a very learned person as well. So I, you know, they, they look at the things and we talk about them and so forth. And, and so it's, uh, very often I, it, the first year, for example, it was already hard to choose. There were three that would have been great for this. Mm -hmm. And in this particular instance, the reason that we uh, chose the outstanding paper we did uh, was that um, I think the first academic conference I ever went to, if not the first, the second, um, my father took me to Indianapolis for an ISI event on Nisbet. Hmm. Um, and I knew how much he loved Nisbet and how much he would have loved uh, Luke's paper. Um, so that was an, an easy one. I wouldn't have had to guess which one dad would have liked. Um, <laughs> that one I knew. Uh, so yeah, we look at these and so we're, 
In part, we're looking at some of the themes that were in his life. In part, we're just looking for excellent scholarship. Uh, and in part, we're looking for the suitability uh, to the topic of place itself. But we are understanding it very, very broadly um, and not in, an, in a narrow sense. Uh, you, you don't have to do a paper on Wendell Berry. There's a lot of ways right. uh, to, to approach uh, place. And it would not have to be. The other thing is, you know, obviously when Nisbet thinks about place, he's thinking about in some ways in a theoretical context where he's uh, uh, trying to think about how much direct control the Leviathan central states have and how few intermediary institutions are left. And so place for him is tied to that. That's one way to think about place, but another way to think about place might be local history. Uh, it might be some insights that some local artist or poet or essayist or intellectual has had uh, that, that, that a, a scholar who wants to come and present with us would work on. We really are quite broad. There, the, you know, once place can be brought into the conversation, there's really little that's sort of disqualifying or uh, eliminating. It's it's just what fits this theme and is, is stimulating and interesting and honors the importance of place. Mm-hmm. Whoever is chosen for the award also uh, receives a registration for the conference and assistance toward their travel and uh, hotel stay. Um, we hope to increase the award as, as time goes on. And so I want to make sure that, just like I did with the Peter Augustine Lawler Award that we announced back in November of 2023, uh, with this uh, award that has already been in place for over a year, um, I want to encourage you that if this sounds like something you would like to support, please consider giving to the Ciceronian Society today. And to give, you can go to ciceronianSociety.org slash donate, and you'll find different ways to give online through Anadot, PayPal. And you can also mail a check made out to the Ciceronian Society Foundation and sent to P.O. Box 1811, Harrisonburg, Virginia, 22803. Giving with non-cash assets and by ACH transfer are also available by uh, options by request. Once again, to give online, go to ciceronianssociety.org slash donate. And please, with any organization, don't hesitate to offer gifts that you think are small. Given how the IRS evaluates public support for nonprofit organizations, having an abundance of these smaller gifts can go a long way towards sustaining your church as well as the Ciceronian Society and other organizations you love. Well, Bill, thank you so much for your time here tonight. It's just great. I, I love hearing about your dad. Um, I'm sad that I only got to meet him once, um, and, uh, but he, he's, his, his legacy lives on in you and in what we're doing. Well, I'm so pleased to be able to talk about him because, of course, it was uh, my great honor to have brought him along to our 2018 uh, conference. And of course, he had been giving money uh, as as the even before we sort of did the reorganization and refounding. Dad had even been giving money to the Cicerone Society in the old days uh, before that, and mm-hmm. was was very much interested in in the themes of tradition, place, and things divine. Dad was a great reader of Russell Kirk and uh, people like that, and he understood uh, the significance of of those themes. And so, it is. Uh, it feels very good to be able to have this prize named after him when I can think about him having attended that conference with us. So it, it, it does my, uh, my heart good. I, I will say that. It's like a way of bringing him back each time. So I love it. It is. It is. You've been listening to The Sower, a production of the Ciceronian Society. If you've enjoyed this conversation, we hope you'll consider joining us for our 2024 conference, February 29th through March 2nd, 2024 at the Hope Center in Plano, Texas. Early bird registration is good through January 1st, 2024, and please note that due to space constraints, we will have to limit attendance to 125 people. We already are getting close to that, so we hope to see you there, and be sure to rate and review this podcast, share it with your friends, check out our website at ciceronianssociety.org, and have a very Merry Christmas. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Thanks for listening.